we usually struggle when it comes to the marriage front, which makes it appear as illusion because we don't always have relationship skills. There, there are those obvious ones that people talk about. They will say, you need to know how to communicate. Communication is important. Well, communication is fine. You use it everywhere at work. They, they teach you. Uh, you need to be able to be clear when you speak to other people. You must learn how to listen, and you must listen actively. You make the other person be aware that you are now listening. True, that's great. Now, the relationship scope component there is, at what point do you know that it's not worth raising this issue? Fine, you know how to communicate. But then you also need to know you need now the wisdom to know, is this issue worth raising? I know how to have a fight. Remember, you need to know how to fight. But is this thing worth fighting over? That's a what? A relationship skill. There are certain things that I want in life and certain things I want from my relationship. That the relationship skill is, how do I determine which things to let go of and which things to hold on to. Because in life, you're not going to get everything you want. Why do I say you're not going to get everything you want? Because if you marry someone who is a sinner, that person has got their own imperfections. There are certain things you dreamt of that are never going to happen. For, just forget it. But to decide what, what to let go of and when to let go of it, now that's a different story. That's, that's a relationship skill. There's, there's, there's an issue as simple as acceptance. Acceptance is some, the bulk of the problems we deal with people in their first 10, 15 years of marriage is acceptance. What do I mean by that? You are this neat person. You've married some disorganized, filthy piglet. <laughs> right? But you're a neat person. But you chose this person. And now that you've married them, you are hoping to make them neat. Really? You're just being unreasonable. This person was a piglet before you met them. They are going to remain a what? Until Jesus comes. They will start being neat in the clouds when they meet Jesus. Here you are fighting, telling us, and I've been saying the same thing a hundred times, and I'm wondering, didn't you realize at eight that he's not going to be neat? How did you get to 10, 11, 15, 20 times saying the same thing? At, at some point you should have realized, hey, my piglet is not going to change. What, why is it still an issue? You are refusing to accept you married a what? A piglet. This is your piglet. You should love your filthy piglet because who chose it? Now that's acceptance. That's accepting Wuti. I married a what? A piglet. You're like, oh, that's piggy. Oh, this is all you married. Now acceptance is a relationship skill because you now have to accept that you may have had dreams that you're going to be there with your stylish husband or stylish wife, you know, dressed to kill. And you discover that you've married someone who's into sandals and track suits and t-shirts that have shade, faded colors. And you're like, what? Why can't you just? And it's like, hey, I'm fine like this. And you are just working hard to get the person to put on socks. And the next thing they put on socks with the sandals, you're like, the two don't go together. They just, and, and they have no sense of the style that you have. Acceptance is to accept Guti. All right, I, I have this one. And they don't see what I see. And so, if, if I'm going to go to a serious event, I might as well choose the outfit myself. I can't send him to go and choose it himself. Or I can't send her. There are some ladies, by the way, who have zero sense of cells. Zero, zero. And, and the other ladies don't help when they say you look wonderful. They, it does, they, they're not helping. They're not helping because you know the truth. Uh, but but they, they don't know. But you just have to accept what your person is not. And whatever dreams you had, that you're gonna be there, you know, looking great together. Go on, accept. This is what you have. Now, acceptance is a powerful skill, and many people struggle with acceptance. My husband is not romantic. Was he ever? <laughs> no. Then then why are we having this discussion? Why are we having the discussion? You should be accepting that you married someone who's great in other areas, but is not what? 
That's acceptance. Now, that's a relationship skill that we usually learn. And this is one of the reasons why people look at the whole relationship and feel this seems to be an illusion because I don't see it working. As, especially when, especially when what, 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 what you, what's missing from your spouse, you can see it somewhere else. Now, let me, let, me, let me tell you a reality. Let me tell you a reality. The reality is this, and th these figures, I, 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 I just attach the figures for you to get the concept. So, so don't worry if it's 75 or 78 or 63. Ah, it's just for you to get the concept. Chances are, when you marry the person that you, that's, that you like, you're terribly in love with, they are, chances are they, are 75, they have 75 percent of what you want. And the other 25% is just not there. Not there. Now, let me tell you how you sabotage your own marriage before it starts. It's hoping that after you get married, you are going to improve the 75 to 100. Once you get into your marriage with that hope, you have chosen to sabotage your own relationship. You have the 75. You're going to get married it's going to drop. It's going to what? It's going to drop. Because now that you are living together, if I used to meet Yama and every time we met, she was on point. Now I live with her. I discover that it's a lot of work for Yama to be on point. And it's not an everyday thing for her to be. It's a lot of work. And, and she's just, uh, all right. It's a lot of work. And now every day I'm like, okay, so. And now because we are now living together, there is no compulsion to be on point every day because it's not sustainable. It's not what? Sustainable. And even if, if I use, even if I, I, I used to find her, her house or apartment or flat or room, whatever it is, clean whenever I came to visit, it doesn't mean she's a clean person. It simply means she made sure her space was clean when I came to visit her. And now that we live together, I discover, hey man, she sweeps once a week. <laughs> and even there, it's the parts you can see. She's not moving furniture. The parts you can see. And now I'm discovering that now. This is why I'm saying that 75% is going to what? It's going to drop. And then you discover that whenever we were together, I would buy you stuff, go out for meals and whatever, and you feel that I like going out. Of course I like going out when it's twice a month. I do. And I don't mind paying when it's twice a month. Now you can't rock up here and expect us to do it twice a week. I'm like, ah, hey, hey, hey. And you're like, what happened with this traditional car? I'm like, hey, hey, let me cook. You're like, you didn't use to mind because it was twice a month and we did not live together. I mind now. And you discover, Oguti, I actually liked home-cooked food. And you wonder, since when? I always have. It's just that when we met, there was no opportunity to cook at the mall. So we bought the food. Is this making sense? Then the 75% does what? It drops. And now your new goal is to go back as close as you can to the 75% you had before you got married. F forget 76, 77. Now, do you realize how the people are saying, I hope he's going to improve after God? Do you realize that they are really messing themselves up? And now you see that there's this missing 25%. Some are trying to make sure it's there. How do we do it? You find people criticizing the missing 25% because they want it to be there. In other words, if I want you to clean, I always complain about the house being dirty. I always complain about why. I'm hoping that by complaining, you're going to improve. But what happens? The more I complain, the more you realize that that means that he doesn't see the 75% that's there. She doesn't see the 75% that is there. They only see that missing 25%. And the person then says, what's the point of me doing the 75%? Because he or she doesn't see it. 
And so some of the things they used to do at 75, they stop doing, and your 75 drops to 60. Because they feel, what's the point? And you now start complaining about the stuff that they stopped doing because they feel, what's the point? Now, the more you complain about the missing 25%, and, and they're, they're just disappeared 15. You see, now you're complaining about the 25, but the 50 that just disappeared. The more you complain, they're like, oh, they don't even appreciate the 60 that's there. It drops to 50. And there you are like, you see what? Well, you, are, you, you are not what I married. And they're like, drop to 40. Now you have a problem. You have a missing 60 and a, press and a reluctant 40. It's like when we told you to get married, we were selling you fake goods. But you were busy pursuing a missing 25%. That's not coming, by the way. It's not coming. Unless the Holy Spirit performs a miracle and the 75% moves to 78. Powerful miracle. A miracle equivalent to Jesus walking on what? 75 to 78. I'm trying to say, until he comes, forget about that story. Of a perfect person. It's not going to happen. And you must also remember that this person you want to improve now where you have your own missing 25 it's just that as human beings we usually say my 25 is my missing 25 is not that big a deal but yours yo and let me tell you the funny thing about the law of attraction usually 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 the if if i'm a neat person now neatness is in my 75 percent eh? I will end up being attracted to someone. Now, I'm, I'm sorry, Yama, to make. I, I'm, I'm usually, I'll be attracted to Yama, and neatness is in Yama's missing 25. What does this mean? It means when we fight about cleanliness, I wonder, Yama, what is so difficult? Why do I ask this question? Because cleanliness is in my 75, but in, it's in her what? 25. Five, I do not understand why it is so difficult. And she's complaining to me about punctuality because punctuality is in her 75, but in my 25. And you hear me saying, we, we, we can't make a big deal about punctuality and compare the two as if they're same. It's just punctuality for heaven's sake. It's about, about arriving on time. It's not a big deal, you know? But cleanliness, oh, come on. <laughs> when you say that, you are usually watering down you're missing 25% and making a big deal about the other person's missing 25%. Do you see how we end up sabotaging ourselves? And then people start gets, and then after a while, that 50 drops to 40, 40 drops to 30, and then someone says, this is not what I signed up for. Because as the other person drops from 75 to 60, you get fed up. Sometimes you fight back. You deliberately drop your 75 to 60 also. Because you feel, if you won't do it, I'm, I'm also not going to do certain things. And then you see there, 60 drop to 50, you drop yours intentionally. To what? To 50. Now, we are in dangerous territory in this relationship. Why? Because each one is fighting back by dropping what they were doing. And you eventually sit with them and ask, guys, if, if it's so bad, how did you end up together? And they're like, well, hey, you know, back then. <laughs> and they start painting a picture of someone who's completely different than what they have now. And you wonder, but what changed? What changed is that as you listen, someone could not stop complaining about the missing 25%. And they, it, it even got to a point where they realized it seems as if the only thing you see when you look at me is the missing 25%. And they also, but I appreciated the 75 that was there. How much time and effort did you put into talking about the present 75? Very little. You spent more time complaining about the what? Missing 25 and so now I changed and talked to you about your missing 25%. And we complain until we both have 10, 10, and we decide to go our separate ways. A relationship skill is to accept, I married this one. Are they perfect? No. 
Now, if the God has been very good to you, very good to you, do you know what God does? You clean pass, you, you, he, he gives you a piglet. But then, then he, he, he provides this marriage with one person who's neat. Who's that person? You don't need an oversupply of cleanliness where both of you are clean. If one is clean, the marriage has the cleanliness. What has the cleanliness? The marriage has it. You, you, you are here, you are this horrible pe person with money. You, you know, you, you blow it and all of those stuff. And the Lord is good to you and gives you someone who is on the stingy side. Why? Because between the two of you, you end up with some form of balance between spending money on great things and long-term sustainability. Do you understand? So in other words, you don't need an oversupply of great financial management. If one of you can, it's fine. Are you going to fight over it? Of course you're going to fight over it. You're two human beings you're in, sinful, in a sinful world. But, but that's what the Lord does. He, he gives you someone who's... You know, if, 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 you are, if you can't keep time, the Lord blesses you with someone who's what? Who's punctual. You don't need an oversupply of punctuality. Just one is enough. Just one. One is going to make a big deal about the... One! And then you run. That's how God helps us to have successful marriages in a sinful world. One of you needs it. How many people? One. One. You marry someone who's antisocial and you fight that this person doesn't like your friend. Friends, is one of you social? Yes. Okay, fine. Then when people come over, guess who's the host? You. But no, I'm tired of doing it myself. If you're tired, sleep, wake up, and do it again. <laughs> Why? You only need one person who's social for this thing to work. But if you accept to go to you are in this sinful world therefore you will not always have an oversupply of things there are certain times when you find that the lord has blessed both of you with the same things those are the the things you have in common you both love to travel and you don't even ask each other you know uh, there's no fighting here it's a question of when how how much and, and it happens but there are instances where you have a very thin supply very thin supply you both don't want to cook and you look at each other and you're like you're the woman you have to cook and the one is like it's 2022 now this 2022 story is why it's because she's lazy because people who like to cook don't care that it's 2022 and they don't mind they don't raise an empowerment issue but once you feel cooking is not my thing you remember hmm by the way who said women are the one who have to cook why you're just not into it then you remember you've got rights why because you you have a thin supply of this desire to cook but when it's something that you do enjoy you know there are people who, who grew up washing cars i i don't like washing cars i i don't I, I have a car i look at it i see it more as a chore so i usually take it to a car wash but there are people who grew up washing th their father's cars their mother's cars, and they loved it because that's how they learned to drive by moving the car a little bit and they would offer to wash the car can i wash the car yes and then they move the car you know <laughs> and then so, so they they got an opportunity to drive the car by washing it and they grew to love they grew to love washing cars those people they take the time to wash their what their car and they just they just love it and they do it and, and now imagine you are the wife you used to wash your your mother or father's car at home and then and then you 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 marry someone like me who's not into that now i say this because my wife prefers to wash her car you know me i'm like baby car wash she's like no how do you find out about the scratches i'm like when i see it that's how she, she really takes the time to do her own car. And it's like, all right. Now, you marry a guy and you feel, why don't you wash the car? And I'm like, I, I, I. Yeah. Right? You, you grow up in the home. You do the you work in the garden. And you feel, you see your father doing it. And you feel, like, yeah, that's what men do. And then you marry someone like me. I used to do the garden at home, but I did not like it. I did, do you know why I did not like it? it? It was always a chore. It's those things you are forced to do. And I told myself in my mind, when I have my own house, I am not going to do this thing. So what do I do? Now I have my own house and I have a yard. And how do I keep the yard clean? I outsource it. I pay someone to do it. And my job is to open in the morning. I take the remote. I press the gate opens and it comes in. And I say, to, I open that little shack that has got the garden tools. And I'm like, you know the story right here. But today, let's work on the leaves, the trees. You know, da, 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 and that's it. I, and that's it. 
That's what I do. And now, if you are going to be this wife who's going, going to think, a man should. I'm like, eh, yeah. You either do it yourself or outsource it as, as long as it's done. As long as it's done. So, but, but you just need to understand that accept this is what you married. Now, you can't come for counseling because your husband won't do the yard. Why? Because he's not doing the yard. He's not doing the yard. Now, imagine you marry a woman who doesn't cook. You know, there are women who don't cook. Four sisters. She's the last. Chance of no her knowing how to cook, ah, uh, not that high. Why? Because chances are the older sisters were doing the cooking, right? And then yeah, now she was just the one who probably washed the dishes or something like that. Now you marry her, wonderful person, wonderful, wonderful, great company, fun to be with. Doesn't want to cook, doesn't know how to cook. Well, she does sometimes, burns them, and, or puts too much salt, whatever the case may be. And, and that's it. When they cook the beetroot, they... they it comes up white. You know, it happens. If you cut the beetroot before you boil it, and you boil it, the red comes out, you end up with white beetroot. I have seen it with my own eyes. If you don't believe me, try it. You're supposed to cook the beetroot whole and then cut it up later. But try cutting up before you boil it. It becomes what? I know. I know. But never mind. Here you are with this person with the beetroot that is what? White. Are you going to fight now and come for counseling because your wife doesn't cook? No, you make a plan, especially if you are the mad kind of man who loves to cook. Then do what? Cook. Now you're going to say, but that's not our culture. Yeah, true. Do you know why it's not our culture? Our culture made sure that the skills they thought girls would need when they became women, they taught them when they were young. So in our culture, girls, women cooked because they started cooking when they were girls. Men did the yard work because they were doing it when they were young. And if you grow up doing something and you love it because everyone is doing it and there's fun associated with it, you grow up as a man to do it. Some of us grow up in the cities. You, you, you grow up in a flat somewhere and it's, it's, just, it's just not there. It's not there. The father was not in the picture. He, came, he went to work in the morning, came back in the evening. This whole thing was done on weekends, if at all. And if he was an elder, he used to do church board meetings and funerals on Sunday. So it, you didn't see it. You didn't see it. And you married someone who's like saying, but as a man, can't you see? It needs paint. You're like, oh. Hmm, paint. And then you wonder, who's going to paint it? You! Like, ah, oh, I'm not a painter. I'm not a painter. So, so acceptance is, is this relationship skill that says, this is who you married. Make it work with what you have. This is the card you were dealt. This is the hand you were dealt. Make life work with this hand. And don't throw tantrums. Make it work with this hand. Now, that's a relationship skill. Now, because we don't have those relationship skills, this marriage that we constantly promote sometimes appears as an illusion because not only are people struggling to get married, people are struggling in those marriages. And people who leave those marriages are like, oh, finally. Uh, I went to speak at some, some government event program. It's a workshop. And so um, people were to, to introduce themselves. And this one lady stands up and says, uh, I am so-and-so, so-and-so. Introduction, introduction. She says, uh, I served my 10 years, uh, and now I am out. <laughs> served. And I'm thinking, served. And then the others are like, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, served? I asked. Served as in like, no, married 10 years. I'm like, oh, served, like, yes. Now, when people say that, you wonder, how is it that if this marriage is supposed to be a blessing, someone feels happier outside than they were inside? And, and you know what? Sometimes it's not even that it's an illusion. You can see it. Hey, they look nicer now. What happened? And they're like, hey, I got free from that. You are you. Oh, God is good. Oh, it was bumpy at the beginning, but oh, now, whew. And you're like, now nah, this, this marriage thing, this is, this is a fake product. This, this is a, a fake product. But the reality is that it's not a fake product. It's just that in a sinful world, something that should have been much easier has taken, up, taken on a a nature of difficulty because now two sinful people 
who were raised in different cultures. I say different cultures because your home and my home are different cultures. Even if you live in the same street and both of your parents are Maswat, it's different cultures. Why? Because different families do things differently. I, there's an example I like to make of sheets. Some people grow up in homes where there are no sheet. There's one sheet, the bottom sheet, and the blanket or duvet or cover or comforter. And that is it. They change the sheet. That's home number one. Home number two, they have two sheets. Now, at the end of the week, the top sheet goes to the bottom, and the bottom sheet goes to the laundry, and it's washed. Right? And as a result, in this home, your linen can be choice assorted. Pink sheet, white, pink bottom sheet, white top sheet, and stuff like that. Sometimes, yeah. Um, so that's house home number two. Right? Top, bottom, bottom, laundry, and it's washed every week. Home number Number three, um, at the end of the week, both sheets, top and bottom, are taken out to the laundry and you put in a new set of sheets. House number three. House number four, you stay in those sheets until they change color. <laughs> and they have some form of smell and then you wash both of them. This is why you need jeek and all of those things so th to remove color because the sheet, you know, the sheet is white at the edges, you know, the parts you tuck and brown in the middle. That's house number four. Now, we are both... Maswati, who grew up in the same area, right? Both of your parents are Swazis, Maswati. Different culture. Because you get into the marriage where now you know Uguti as a man, you grew up in house number three, end of the week, the set goes out, laundry, put in a new set. You marry someone coming from house number four. The sheets stay in until they change color, right? That's a different culture. You're going to fight over those things. So the reality is this. We now live in a sinful world. Two sinners are getting married who come from different cultures, who see the same thing differently. And these two people are supposed to make something, something that was supposed to work in a perfect world. They're supposed to make it work here in a sinful world. Man, it's a difficult one. This is where the Holy Spirit Spirit comes in, and the Holy Spirit does you a great favor by not necessarily working on your spouse, but working on you. But most prayers about my, please change my spouse. Wrong prayer. R wrong prayer. Why? Because God is not in the business of forcing people. If he was, everybody would be converted already. He has chosen to stand at the door and what? And knock. The advantage when you pray, you, you are already standing at the door, willing to open. You might as well pray for yourself. <laughs> right? If you're praying for the spouse, the spouse could be watching TV, not hearing the knock. And you are praying, oh Lord, Please change my spouse. When are you at the door? So you might as well pray for the Lord to change who? You. And because we usually mess it up even with the prayer, instead of asking the Lord to change you so that you are an easier person to live with, someone who doesn't always keep records of the missing 25%, so that you can be a pleasure to live with and this thing can be successful. You pray for the spouse, you see the fault of the spouse and for anybody who's watching, ranging from the children to your siblings, to your cousins, to your community, to your church members, they look at this thing and they say, I see they promote it in church, but this looks like fake goods. I'm here to say today, it's not fake goods. It's not. It's a wonderful relationship that has seasons. Spring, summer, autumn, winter, but spring comes again, and then summer. Talk to anyone who's been married for a long time. They will tell you, yeah, that is true. They may not give you the details of winter, but they will say it is what? It is true. How long have the mashwamas been married? 31 years. All right. Now, that's an internal disagreement. 32 
All right, don't worry. Those are, those are normal with people who've been married. Now, in those 32 years of marriage, those 32 years of marriage, you've had your seasons, right? All four of them. They will not tell you the details of the winter. They might give you a glimpse of the autumn. But, but when we see them, we see spring and the what? And the summer. That's not fake goods. When they tell you these things are going to pass, they're telling the truth. It's just that they don't always want to tell you you the autumn and the winter and the reason is sometimes sometimes this most of the time the reason is this we tell you our winters you gossip about our what our winters so fine leave our winters alone but it's not a fake product it is not an illusion it is still a blessing that God created for us and our benefit now does it mean that there's something fundamentally wrong with people who've given up on their marriages and walked away. No. Sometimes you just marry some Hong Kong person. But sometimes, sometimes later on when you look back, you're like, yeah, he was Hong Kong, she was Hong Kong. Maybe I could have reacted differently. But those things happen later on in life. But I, but I wanted to talk about the relationship itself and say, yes, it's there. And we still do have successful marriages. You, you, you had, I didn't say happy, right? I said what? Successful because of the whole season. And they come back. Right? We still do have successful marriages. And the longer you stay in a successful marriage, the happier you are because it improves the quality of our lives. Because let me tell you this, there comes a point in our, when you are married where you get tired. tired. You know what happens when you're tired? You see a fight coming from a distance. <laughs> you go that way. <laughs> And yeah, now, now, now you understand good what's happening. And, and, and you, you find that now you are, you are getting into the space of happily married. Why? Because at this point, you can hear someone say something, and then your mind says, hey, 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 remember, you are deaf. You are deaf. You are deaf. And you don't hear anything, and you just, serious, there are things that spouses say, and other people are shocked. Oh, did you hear? What? You're like, ah, you, serious? <laughs> deaf? And the deafer you are, the happier you are. Why? Because you don't follow everything else. Then you realize after a while, you, hear, you, can, you can have a fight, a big fight for three minutes. Boom, 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 boom. And then afterwards, you show the person, look, Facebook. <gasps> Serious? <laughs> Why? Because at some, at some point, you realize we can't be fighting, man, for, for, for a whole day. Too tired. We don't have the energy to fight the whole. Sometimes I was like, Really, baby, are we really gonna fight? And that was like, Nama, Nama, I don't wanna fight. Yeah, let's not fight. And you just move on. And, and then you, when you're still young, you feel you, you just left it like that. Yeah, why? Tired. T tired. And you move into that space where you are okay. And when the other one starts throwing a tantrum, you still, and the people are like, What are you gonna do? Ah, that's how they are. Have you noticed this is a phrase? People have been married successful for a long time. When one goes on a big thing, they're like, Ah, that's how they are. Unjalo <laughs> vel. You're like, what do you mean, Unjal? Ah! They've moved into the space of happily married. They know I'm not changing this one. This is how they are. Ah, it's fine. He'll be okay. He'll be okay. Ah, she'll be okay. And she starts shouting like, ah, you know your mother. A phrase like that, ah, you know your mother. This is how she is. And then, you know, that's your father. You knew. What did you expect? Now, at that point, there's... Any questions before we pray and... <laughs> Any questions? Because of these lights, I'm not always able to see the hands. Because when I look this side, the glaring of the soul, it, it would help to... Is there a hand here? Yes, go ahead. Let's, let's get... They, they want you to have a mic. Thank you. Thank you, Mfundisi. I really enjoyed that and your perspective and your point of view. I was just wondering if you would maybe give us your thoughts on this, um, approaching it from a, a single person, but knowing that society, but especially the church, has a, let's call it preoccupation, not obsession with marriage, and it feels like everything is just grooming you for marriage and there isn't much of a focus on 
you as an individual growing, fulfilling your potential, being happy, being accomplished, it almost feels like the end goal is marriage and that's the focus. Um, maybe your thoughts on a single person and maybe what the church could do to encourage healthy, fulfilled, single individuals who would then, I suppose, make even better marriage partners because they've been able to, I think you understand what I mean. <laughs> single, we, generally when, we, when, when, when you look at what the church believes on paper and what people talk about the most, it's, you, sometimes there's a disconnect. We do not hold the view as a church that being single is evil or less than. Why? Because when you get to, by the time you get to the New Testament, the priority is salvation. This is why Paul is able to say, I wish you were like me. So that you can devote your entire time and energy and everything to spreading of the gospel. So you get there and you realize, yay, you can be viably single. In fact, it's one of the things that if you can do, it can be a tremendous blessing. I mean, if, if marriage was this thing that you, you had to do or else, then, then Jesus should have gotten himself a bride, you know? Even in the Old Testament, you've got guys like Jeremiah who never really got married. Daniel, we suspect, could have been a eunuch, so, <laughs> yeah. But by the time you get to the New Testament, you see the value of being single. So we, we do not hold the view that being single is either evil or being single, single is less than the ideal. We do not hold that view as a church. However, the people who become members of the church come from cultures. And in our cultures, we, 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 we value marriage a lot. And so we don't usually encourage people to be single. From a church's perspective, we, we, we also understand that people are multifaceted. We believe as an Adventist church in, in the whole person whole person. This is why we have your health ministries, your family ministries, your stewardship. And these are not always geared towards helping you to get married. They are geared towards preparing you for life. When we talk about how you manage your finances in the stewardship department, we are getting you for life, your faithfulness. When you talk about how you manage your time, how you manage your resources, your talents, this is, this is a life thing. When we talk about you, how you manage your health from the health ministry's perspective, how you can live a, a lifestyle that is healthy for your physical body and for your mind, that's for the life. When we talk about family ministries, we don't just talk about married. When we talk about marriage people, we talk about married people and we talk about um, singles and we talk about parenting and so on. But when we talk about singles, we don't, it's true that when we get into the married family ministry space, we don't always talk about single people as much as we talk about married people because we are trying to speak to that ideal. Now the question is, can we talk more in the married, family married ministry space, can we talk more, more to single people about how they can be successfully single and actually label it that way and not expect you to put the dot, to connect the dots yourself. We can, but we don't do it as often and it's one of those things we have to improve on because on paper we should. Anything, everything you read in family ministries will tell you it's a different type of, we have to address single people, not just single unmarried, uh, we've got single divorced, single uh, widowed, we have single never married, we have single with children, you know, we've got different types of people who are single, and, and so we have to minister to different uh, uh, t types of people within the family. So on paper we should, doesn't always translate, which means that when we become family ministries leaders in our local churches, we have to be somewhat balanced. There is a real fear that even after we have helped you to live a successful life uh, um, and how to be successful in your life, in, in choice of career, you have a great vocation, you've got a great ministry going for you, 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 you your health is on point, your relationships are fine, your stewardship is great. There's the real fear that when the sun sets on Sabbath and we've had Vespers, there is a thirst <laughs> a thirst and a loneliness you find when you come back from work during the week. And sometimes that loneliness 
comes in two ways. Sometimes it's a, it can be a strong sexual urge. Sometimes it can just be a desire to have company. To just to walk into to a house and there's somebody there. Um, you, you know, you know I, I, I've noticed at home that when my wife is not there and, and my kids are not there and, and I'm just alone, the house feels very empty. But when she's there, but in another room, I'm fine. <laughs> in other words, she doesn't have to be here. I just need to know she's, she's around. And sometimes it comes in that form. And because we know how difficult that, that can be to deal with and how that can un dealt with, it, 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 you know, it, it, it can last you for a lifetime. And we don't always want you to go through that. You will find that the, the, and it comes from a good place. The promotion for marriage comes from the fact that we know what sometimes we can be tempted to do when that thirst and loneliness kicks in. And that's some of the things that drive the promotion of marriage. Now, do we sometimes mess it up? Yes, because when, you're, when I ask a young lady, lady when are you getting married it's an unreasonable question it assumes you can go to pick and pay and pick up a husband it's like it's like it's as if you were busy and just make time to find one you know but the reality is that you, you can't just make time and and get a husband um so so so, so sometimes we ask these questions as though it's within the control of the people who are supposed to ask answer to get married and so i would say to people who are older yes the question comes from a good place but it doesn't always land and well it puts pressure on the young women particularly such that they can end up making choices that they know are not good for them but just because they just want to tick this box and sometimes they know go Going in. I do a lot of premarital counseling. Some people know going in that thing is, is shaky. And then they end up saying, we'll just have to pray for it. I'm like, no. Like, God did it before. Like, yeah. I mean, if you open the Red Sea, this is not the Red Sea. But yeah. And, 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 People just hope that it's going to happen. When it doesn't happen, they feel, well, I prayed, I tried. So, so, so yes, it can be done. Um, it's being done now on a very low key, on a very small scale, but, but it can be done. Um, the, the, the resources are there to do it. Um, and, and so, yeah, local church, it can be done. can be done at the conference. We can do it at the union. We try to do it in big events, but those big events are once off, you know, once in a while. So, so that emphasis has to be in the local church. And this is why, just promotion, this is why there is a 10 module family ministries leadership uh, program. And part of that program is to prepare local church leaders to be able to minister to all kinds of people, ranging from children to single to married, divorced, widowed, the whole nine yards. Um, it's available, um, so it can be done so that our local church leaders can be more of a blessing than anything else. I was informed a while ago that our time is done. Do we have one more question or we're done? Yes, you we will be the last question. Go ahead. There's a hand here, and then we will uh, wrap up this evening. Uh, um, I have just a, a simple 
simple question. You know, sometimes when we have these kind of sessions whereby we get advice about what it, if, what it means to have, like, what it, it means to have a godly marriage or what it means to have a good marriage or a successful marriage. And most of the times, I can maybe say nine out of ten, if these sessions are within church, most of those answers will include make God your foundation. But then what does that entail particularly? Could you maybe perhaps give practical examples or like um, certain instances or circumstances or things that maybe perhaps that you do yourself that uh, entail and um, mean that you have God as your foundation? All right. At some point, when you are married to your spouse, um, you, you are going to, the weight of their voice is going to lessen. And when they want you to do something, you will feel, right? And do what you want to do. In those, when that time comes, I'm not saying if, I'm saying, When? Because it's going to happen. When that time comes, you need someone with a voice that can make you do things that you don't want to do, that you're not inclined to do. Now, some people will say, no, that person is my friend. That person is my mother. That person is my father. When we say make God your foundation, we are saying in your own personal life, make sure that God has authority on you. So that when you open the Bible and your spouse has hurt you and God says, love keeps no record of wrongs. Of course, you don't want to hear that from your spouse who has hurt you. You don't want to hear it from his friends or his family. Sometimes you may not want to hear it from your parents who are trying to make sure that they are not embarrassed by their child's marriage who collapses. But when you hear it from the Lord and he has authority in your life, you are more inclined to order your life in that direction. When the same God is going to say love is kind, you, you, you. Thank you for your support. Thank you for providing um, the experiences and the, and, and, the, and the amens and the hallelujahs and everything that you, you brought to this day. I pray that God God blesses you. I pray that he enriches your lives continuously. And that the next time we come together in this fashion, that you will not only come yourself, but you will bring someone else with you. With that, uh, I want us to rise as we offer our closing prayer. Um, I will ask uh, Asitanda Zeni Baba yetu na mwasha nkulungu lete mbegile Au kake wasi chapisa njana nkulungu lete mbegile being a faithful God and deliberations the lessons in particular that will take too long. Stalangos, the bank of the Bacolabas, the city, 
and everyone who partook in these programs.